So I checked WebMD, and it turns out I've been dead for 37 years. Boo. See, it all started with a stress headache, a body temp slightly above normal, and a quick search on your favorite online health service. I typed how I was feeling into the symptoms checker, and my suggestive condition included herpes with a side of cancer and a dash of hepatitis. Don't worry, though. Guac was extra. Did I mention that I have an 84% chance of being 65 months pregnant? I mean, damn grandma, I know Jesus loves me, but he doesn't have to love me that much. But when I told my mom about my prognosis, she added one more symptom to my list. I'm black. And after that, my diagnosis got a whole lot simpler. I had acute racism poisoning. And as crazy as it may sound, racism can be just as bad, if not worse, than any disease WebMD could have come up with. All of us acknowledge that racism exists. And if you don't, this is gonna be a long 10 minutes. And as a result, we have tried to tackle it with social and economic policy. But here's the plot twist. Racism still exists today. But Milwaukee County has a different idea. The county recently declared racism a public health crisis, meaning they're going to treat it like any other disease or pandemic. And maybe they were onto something, because after surveys, studies, and a whole lot of science, Professor David Williams at the Harvard School of Public Health explains that racism is a stressful life experience that can have negative impacts on health. And as Professor Williams so eloquently put it, all of this discrimination can literally be deadly. So if you're like me and you don't like people dying, it's time to explore racism as a public health issue by first seeing how it manifests in the body, then how scientists came to the determination that it is a public health crisis before finally looking at some implications. Because solving racism could be just a, <coughs> a way. See, you thought that was a joke. No, that was herpetitic cancer. Now the health disparities between black and white Americans has long been debated by anthropologists, sociologists, epidemiologists, and even yo mamaologists. But in order for us to truly understand how they derived this from this, we have to start inside. University of Michigan public health professor, Dr. Arlene Geronimus, was the first to introduce the concept of weathering, or the deterioration of health as a result of consistent exposure to systematic racism. She explains that weathering causes DNA methylation, which is an epigenetic mechanism that occurs by the addition of a methyl group. But I don't get that, you don't get that, and somehow it's racist? Okay. We all know that DNA is the little figure right inside your body that makes you, you. Your DNA is a set of instructions that code for proteins that go on to do super cool stuff, like make sure your jewel doesn't kill you. But in order to save your life, a super special wannabe starting something protein has to attach itself to the DNA. However, during a racist encounter, a super special wannabe stopping something methyl group blocks the protein from getting to work. So when you hear DNA methylation, think your DNA is left on red, no proteins are made, and it leads to what Dr. Geronimus calls a general health vulnerability. In fact, Dr. Amaya Nurjeter at the University of California, Berkeley, found that because of DNA methylation, an average person of color in America will be more susceptible to amputations as a complication of diabetes kidney failure, lung disease and asthma, heart disease, and depression, just to name a few. It's so interesting, they even made another study about it, the Intergen study. Researchers at Yale and Emory University found a direct link between substantially methylated DNA and racist events, like being unfairly fired, denied a loan, or stopped by the police. But what exactly makes a public health crisis? And does racism meet these criteria? The short answer is yes, but I like my answers tall, dark, and handsome, so let's keep going. According to Doc McSuffins and the World Health Organization, 
In order for something to be a public health crisis, it must first be a pandemic or epidemic disease, and second, pose a substantial risk to a significant number of people. But Genesis, racism isn't a disease and it only affects my one black friend. Settle down, audience. Because according to Merriam-Webster, for something to be a disease, it must impair functioning and have signs and symptoms. But we just saw how racism impairs DNA functioning, and it does in fact have signs and symptoms. According to Dr. Nancy Cracker at Harvard University, the most common being hypertension. Second, the Center for American Progress confirms that people of color make up 40% of Americans today, and racism is affecting all of them. But Nobody can just Rachel Dolezal their way out of disease, especially when that disease is a global pandemic. As Memphis community pastor and activist Earl Fisher puts it, if white America has a cold, non-white America has the flu. If white America has COVID-19, then what do we have? Coronavirus has been called the great equalizer but our attempts to flatten the curve have only widened the gap. At disproportionately higher rates than their white counterparts, communities of color face more barriers to health care and insurance, more health risks due to socioeconomic circumstances like homelessness and urban living, and more opportunities to fall seriously ill due to underlying health conditions. These compound disparities and hundreds of years of racism have created a lethal storm for my community. For example, in Louisiana alone, despite being only a third of the population, black people make up 70% of coronavirus deaths. And so it makes me wonder, if white America recovers, when will we? So, racism is a public health issue, but there are no vaccines for racism, no cure. We can't just inject everybody with anti-idiot serum. Instead, we can just look at the implications and imagine. Imagine a world where racism is actually treated like a disease. Well, for starters, being racist costs money. I'm talking Bezos breakup kind of money. According to the Harvard Business Review, we spend over $265 billion on illness-related lost productivity, excess healthcare expenditures, and premature deaths, all related to racism. By being just a little less racist, America could literally save money and live better. Walmart knew what was up. And second, imagine a reinvigorated law enforcement Boston University and the University of Pennsylvania explain what a quote, public health perspective on 21st century policing would look like. No officer would leave the academy without training on implicit and explicit bias and how that affects people's actions under stress, effectively decreasing police killings in black and brown communities. But I get it. Some of you may be wondering, how does this affect me? Well, for starters, all types of discrimination, not just racism, affect our health. Sexism, ableism, homophobia, xenophobia, all of it makes us sick. Our bodies don't care what society projects on us, but once it feels attacked by systemic inequality or otherwise, it responds, it weathers, and eventually it breaks down. And finally, you could be a straight, white, cisgendered, able-bodied, upper-class male, and you will still feel the effects by a little something called secondhand discrimination. As University of Florida Connie Mulligan explains, simply knowing someone affected by discrimination will increase your genetic markers for chronic stress, anxiety, and depression. Just like secondhand smoke, secondhand discrimination is worsening our health. So, like any disease, racism will continue to evolve with us, and there is still so much left to unpack. But what we do know is that no matter who you are, your health is being compromised. Do with that information what you will, but at least now you're informed. 
If you want to keep being racist, that's up to you. I'm here for a good time. And as studies have shown, not a long time.